So I thought I would start my second Galatians video with something that has nothing to do with Galatians, and that is a poem by Billy Collins, the poet laureate for the United States. He'd be glad to tell you that. It's called Lucky Cat. It's a law as immutable as the ones governing bodies in motion and bodies at rest that a cat picked up will never stay in the place where you choose to set it down. I bet you'd be happy on the sofa or this hassock or this knitted throw pillow are a few examples of bets you are bound to lose. The secret of winning I have found is to never bet against the cat, but on the cat preferably with another human being who, unlike the cat, is likely to be carrying money. And I cannot think of a better time to thank our cat for her obedience to that law, thus turning me into a consistent winner. She's a pure black one, quite impossible to photograph and prone to disappearing into the night or even into the thin shadows of, moon, of noon. Such an amorphous blob of blackness is she, the only way to tell she is approaching is to notice the two little yellow circles of her eyes. Then only one circle when she is walking away with her tail raised high. Something like the lantern signals of Paul Revere, American silversmith, galloping patriot. Isn't that a great poem? I love it. Isn't that perfect? Look at the little animals. Oh, tell you, they're chowing down. All right, back to Galatians. Not a moment too soon. Blew a minute and 49 on that. Understanding Galatians rightly is important for our understanding of Paul and the New Testament as a whole. It gives us a chance to understand Paul because there's quite a bit of Pauline chronology and autobiography. In other words, Paul is writing about himself. It traces the course of the early apostolic uh, history as well. You get a picture of James here and Peter, who is called Cephas in this document. And it determines many New Testament critical and canonical issues. That is, it, it alludes to texts and, uh, you know, verifies some texts such, uh, such as Acts and some others. Um, however, there are some issues uh, that, uh, that crop up notoriously. Um, Paul's, uh, Paul's differentiation between the flesh and the spirit. Galatians 5 with its discussion in Romans 8, very important and, and uh, uh, analogous. Flesh is like the physical stuff, the lump stuff, the stuff that's just material. It could go, it could stay. Uh, spirit is the live spiritual stuff infused with God's presence and, and you know, coming to life. And so what's the difference between the two? The flesh is easily overrun and the spirit is powerful. Um, I'm going to, uh, what I'm going to do here is I see these little notes and uh, I'd like to start with the text. So I'm going to go back and pull the text over and you can see it here. This is the introduction uh, to, to, the, uh, to the text and we've seen that in the first video. Notice that Jesus Christ and God the Father. There's no mention of the Spirit here with uh, Jesus Christ and God the Father who raised him, Jesus, from the dead. So there's definitely agency. The Father maintains agency. And all the members, notice how Paul puts it, of God's family who are with me. That's going to be a very important piece, God's family. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins to set us free from the present evil age according to the will of our God and Father, to whom be the glory forever and ever. Amen. A great introduction, verses 1 through 5. And then look what happens. Paul has been simmering here, and then he just boils over like a pot of boiling pasta that is too full. I am astonished that you are so quickly deserting the one who called. Notice the th he is just flummoxed. And what's the issue? That the Christians that he had long labored over are fleeing to deserting to the, the one who called you in grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel. Verse 7, not that there is another gospel, but there are some, these are the teachers, 
that uh, many people, of course, recognize scholars that these are the uh, these are these people who are confusing you and want to pervert the gospel. Look at what he says about the gospel. But even if an angel from heaven should proclaim to you a gospel contrary to what we proclaim to you, let that one be accursed. As we have said before, so now I repeat: if anyone proclaims to you a gospel contrary to what you received, let that one be accursed. This would be a good time to remember what the gospel, what the gospel really is. What is the gospel? Now remember the good news, uh, that's the literal translations, uh, translation of euangelion for good news. That's, and you can remember, maybe you can remember Mark 1.1, 1, 1. this is the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Um, and you can, you can remember the, the kind of like anti-imperial feeling that you get. From, uh, from such a text. So this is a subversive character, but the term gospel especially used by the earliest Christians. And it's also, but the term gospel, you hear people say it's the gospel truth, so it's used that way. But gospel can also be seen as a cipher for the overall message. And that's where the way Paul is using it here, and it's his particular message. Paul draws his message in a line that's continuous, he thinks, from Jesus, the resurrected Christ, and on through his ministry. And he's supposing that there are some who come along and try to distort it afterwards. So this is a cipher. The gospel is a cipher for the message about Jesus, his birth, ministry, death, resurrection, that ends up providing reconciliation and forgiveness for the world. Those who put their trust in God's grace in Christ live out this newfound life in the power of the life-giving spirit. So this is what Paul says people have come to thwart. They've come to subvert. And we're going to find out how that happens. So he says it's so important that no one fool with it. He said even if an angel drops out of heaven and says a different gospel. Well, you know, um, we've had a fair amount of, of changeable messages. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a foregone conclusion that people will manipulate the fundamental message about the sacrifice of Jesus and the meaning of the way that the Father sends the Son and and then the result. Uh, it's As a matter of fact, who can really say whose particular gospel message can be drawn in a line that's continuous from the pages of the Old and the New Testaments? We can try our best. You know, we can try our best, but so anyway, this is how important Paul feels. Look at it. He says, if anybody does this, if anybody proclaims you a different gospel, let that one be accursed. And he's talking about divine approval. Now, here he wants to talk about his own apostleship in verse 11 and following of chapter 1. This is really interesting because it gives you a sense of Paul's uh, autobiography. And you know what you should do? Just hit the pause button right now and skim read the passages from 111 through 214. Why don't you do that? And maybe I'll do the same. We can get together. Uh, just here we go. Pause. 111 through uh, chapter 2. You get all of this really great information about the Apostle Paul. Uh, it's an autobiography. That is, he's writing it himself. He's he, this is not Acts. Although you can look at Acts nine and you can see some of this stuff. Uh, he says, "I want you to know, brothers and sisters, the gospels proclaimed by me is not a human origin. I did not receive it from a human source, nor was I taught it. I received it through a revelation of Jesus Christ." And without question, I think Paul is referring there to his Damascus Road experience. Now, he never clarifies what that is. I would love to see his point of view on it for him to describe it. Here he only talks about it as a revelation. And here's our word. I don't know if you can see it. Let me move this over just a little bit. Apocalypsios. That is the, the revelation of Jesus Christ. So he's, then he appeals to the testimony about how he persecuted the church. Look what he says. He advanced in Judaism beyond many of my people my own age, far more zealous. And then God called and uh, through his grace revealed. There's the second time in verse 16 to reveal his son uh, in me. Uh, he, here's where it says that. Um, Apocalypse to reveal. That's the infinitive right there. Um, 
when when God was pleased to reveal his son so that I might proclaim him among the, the Gentiles, I did not, look what he says, I did not confer with any human being, nor did I go up to Jerusalem to those who were already apostles before me, but I went away at once into Arabia after three years, Cephas, and then maybe the Lord's brother James. And so um, he sees James and Peter, that's it. He goes to Syria, Cilicia. This is probably when he goes with uh, Barnabas. Uh, and uh, so they've only heard it said, the one who formerly was persecuting us is now proclaiming the faith he once tried to destroy. Now, what's the point of all this? The point of all this is Paul is showing that his message, his message is not drawn from any kind of human authority, that his message is one that comes directly from God. Now, can it really come directly from God? His conversion could, his, the revelation he received could, but how does he maintain this? This is really interesting. Has God been his teacher all along? He only confers with Peter and with James. Apparently, they're the ones who fill in the gap. You, you may recall that Paul's Paul's journey was one that he probably was more of a vigilante persecutor of the church. And as such, he uh, he was given fairly wide latitude. He was a rabbi. He was training to be a rabbi, uh, training to be a Pharisee. And you remember that little bit. And he was zealous for the traditions of his ancestors until he had to renegotiate his Judaism. Paul never gives up his Judaism. He does go through a process of reinterpreting and reintegrating and renegotiating. And sometimes when he's writing these texts, it can feel strained in, in that regard because he's writing to Gentiles. He's not writing to Jews. That is clearly the case here in Galatians. So what is it, what's important? Paul is establishing that he, his gospel is not the kind of message that's built on anybody's opinion. He didn't draw it from anybody. He's not looking to please anybody. He's only looking to please God. So after three years, he, talks, he does go up, and then we get to chapter 2. Look at this little interest right here. Um, so this is the, the Jerusalem Council uh, discussed in Acts 15. And so you get a sense there, Paul and Barnabas and some of the others were appointed to go up to Jerusalem to discuss this question. That is, how, uh, how, what is the relationship of circumcision? You can see it up there. What's the relationship between circumcision and these Gentiles who are coming to the faith? Um, so here he goes. He goes uh, Barnabas and Titus. And so that's why I think, by the way, going back, this letter has to be past that. It can't be a letter that's before that, obviously. But uh, so I, I think that this letter is a little more mature for Paul and uh, at the same time in, in the shadow of the Jerusalem Council, not in its anticipation. So Titus was not compelled to be circumcised. And so he's, he, you know, and then because of false believers secretly brought in who slipped in to spy on the freedom we have in Christ Jesus so that they might enslave us, and then Paul interrupts his own sentence. We did not submit to them for a moment. So the truth of the gospel might always remain in you. What does that mean to spy out on the freedom? They were checking to see if Titus was circumcised. And I would submit that that's a little creepy. Uh, they're a little voyeuristic, Paul's opponents. And Titus never succumbed to the notion that he had to be circumcised here. And so he is in the midst of describing the ramifications. Um, and the, the Jerusalem Council, you know, the ramifications are that uh, the Gentiles are going to be able to come into the family. Well, that's why it's interesting that Paul uses family at the beginning, that they don't have to be circumcised, but they do have to follow a couple of food laws and avoid uh, sexual immorality. So uh, here is where Paul introduces um, James. This is Peter and John, now acknowledged pillars, recognize the grace that had been given to me. They gave to Barnabas and me the right hand of fellowship, agreeing that we should go to the Gentiles. So this is Paul saying, they endorsed us. We are good. Our message is secure and true. And therefore, we're to be trusted, as is our message. Um, but you're going to find out 
that things don't always stay good. So the issue is over circumcision and whether or not a Gentile can be fully into the body of the faithful. Are they full members? I hope you enjoyed this. Write something that you learned in the comments below. You may even want to subscribe. We'll see you next time.